Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of OP Radio. It's your host, Mac. OP Radio is a weekly Twitter space we hold every Wednesday to talk with the people and projects in the optimism ecosystem. We have another excellent show lined up for you today with a very interesting guest. Can't wait to talk to him. Let's get right into it. Good morning, Richard. How are you doing? Yeah, Mac, doing very well. Well, super excited to have you here today, Richard, and to talk to you about NFTs and Manifold Studio and, and Manifold in general. Before we get into that, though, I would love to hear a bit more of your personal background. What were you doing before crypto, if there ever was such a time? I know you've been in crypto for a while now. Yeah, that's a long time ago, right? So, you know, I got into crypto around 2012, so started off in early Bitcoin. Before that, I was a mobile developer, so I used to make iPhone apps. I think one of the biggest apps I made is a social media app called Hootsuite. So I was their original iPhone developer. And then, yeah, I did that. And then once I discovered crypto and Bitcoin, I just kind of went all in and just started diving into, you know, that world. It's funny because it wasn't called crypto back then. It was just called Bitcoin because that was the only thing that was available. The only crypto available. Bitcoin was crypto at that time. Yeah, Bitcoin was crypto. Then it turned into crypto. And now it's turned into Web3. And that was already, and that was all the way back in 2012, you said? Yeah, 2012. Right. So, you know, it sounds like a long time ago, but you got to remember that Bitcoin was actually available for five years prior to that because it came in, in 2017. Yeah. So, or 2007. Well, I can tell you're, you're a, you're a early mover, you're a first mover in a lot of things, Richard, not the least of which is because your, your Twitter, your Twitter handle is so coveted and succinct. For those listening, Richard has just at Richard, which I imagine is hard to come by. Yeah. Well, you also got to remember, I used to be at Twitter client developer at Hootsuite. So back in the early day when Twitter was first getting started, I was one of the early kind of creators of a, a very popular Twitter client. Yeah, so I'm I'm picking up a theme here, Richard, which is that you're you're always on the cutting edge. Yeah, try, try to be. Try to be like interesting. Yeah, and you also have a CryptoPunk PFP, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? So another, another first mover advantage there. <laughs> and Richard, I actually, the first time, we've actually met in person. I think we met during... It was in Miami at Art Basel. And something that struck me about you is your sh- you had two different kinds of shoes on that matched your crypto punk. You had, I think, like a red and a blue shoe. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also wearing a tree glasses, you know, part of my, my identity that I've associated with my crypto punk. Yeah, I thought that was just fantastic. I, I don't think I'd ever seen that before. Somebody wearing like two different kinds of shoes at the same time. I don't know why more people don't do it. And I didn't make CryptoPunk connection at the time, but of course now it makes sense. Cool. Okay, so Richard, I wonder if you could, you know, I think you're someone who's uniquely positioned to sort of talk to us about NFTs. I want I want to hear like from your side, from your perspective, like what what are NFTs and and why do you find them so interesting and what what do you find promising about NFTs? Yeah, so you know, I think the first thing is like how do I get into NFTs? So you know, I've been in crypto for a while, and it almost felt like during that whole time, the only kind of interesting use case for crypto was just financial, financial applications. So I've been moving money back and forth, you know, trying to find different ways or different like interesting ways of interacting with kind of the idea of currency online. But when I discovered NFTs, it just kind of flipped a switch for me. All of a sudden, there was this like consumer application that almost everyone got. Well, you know, when you, when you collect the NFT, it's like collecting a digital digital object. And so the interesting for me from a technology perspective is that the blockchain and the NFT protocols and all the property, what it does is that it gives digital objects the, phys- the properties of physical physical objects. So mainly around ownership, being able to transact. And this has never been done before. Like this is the very first time that this has been possible through the, through the technology. And what's that, once you understand that, it's like really interesting because you know there's so many digital assets and so many digital objects that can be created or waiting to be created or have been created already. That can now be added and actually have you know value create attached to them. And so when you think about NFTs, one of the biggest, I guess, use cases for them was you know art, the art industry. And so for the longest time, you have a lot of digital creators that were kind of disenfranchised because there was no way to monetize their art. The way you would monetize digital art was that you would create physical prints and sell those. Or you know, these digital artists could go work for various production companies, doing commercials and freelance work. And, you know, just sort of making ends meet and working for the check So all of a sudden, NFTs come along and you're like, oh, I can actually work on my own art that, and provide that. And that has value to, you know, society in general because you know, we all agree that art has, you know, has value. And then 
NFTs have enabled that whole ecosystem to start thriving. And that's like where we're at today. Yeah, thank you for that. Very interesting. And I think this is maybe a part of this larger trend. I wonder what you think of this where, you know, from my perspective, it seems like just everything is digitizing, right? Like, so everything is moving online, or in this case, on chain, and and art included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, as you said, more, you know, I think that as people are spending more and more time on digital devices and online. And so I, I think it makes sense that where you spend your time is where your attention goes. It just totally makes sense that there's going to be the idea of digital assets in the future, especially as you know we have generations of kids and teenagers who just only know online. And we think about all these games, all these like internet properties, there's just more and more creation happening and more and more engagement happening online. It's almost like, you know, and in my life, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm an exception or not, but I spend probably more than half my time on a computer and half the time in real life. So it makes sense that I would actually own digital assets and NFTs because, you know, it's, that's where a lot of my attention is these days. Yeah. And, and it's also very interesting when these NFTs, the, the digital space also connects back to the real world. And I think there's a, a lot of different use cases, a lot of different projects have done. I, I, I like that, you know, clever and creative example of you wearing those two different kinds of shoes. I thought that was just, I don't know, just this funny connection between your online avatar and, and your IRL avatar. Okay, yeah. so Richard, maybe maybe take me through back when you co-founded Manifold. Can you walk me through that process? Like, obviously, you've been involved in the internet for a long time. You're you were early to crypto. Can you walk me through your thought process behind creating like an NFT platform? Like, why NFTs? Yeah. So when I first discovered NFTs, I started off as a collector and just really thought the NFTs were cool and really liked the work. Started connecting to a bunch of artists, and as you started talking to the artists. You could tell that most of these artists were like really, really excited about what NFTs have to offer, but they had no idea behind the technology that was running running things. And so for a lot of artists, when you talk to them, they're like, well, NFTs are a way for me to sell my digital art. And you know, the primary method of selling their art was through various platforms, right? So you have OpenSea, you have Nifty Gateway, Foundation, and so forth. But what these artists didn't realize was that this choice of technology had very big implications for how you kind of engage with the ecosystem. And so what we saw was that we saw these platforms as being sort of the hubs for for art creation. But the thing is, coming from a crypto background, they did offer the artists like true sovereignty over the kind of base underlying technology that were that they were creating artworks on. So it's almost like you know you're given a canvas, like what kind of canvas do you want? Do you want something that comes from Walmart and it's just like this fancy kind of thing? that only has one form factor, or do you want something that's like a true canvas that you can like really create? And so we started working with one artist in particular at the very start, his name was Maddox Jones. And we did a few campaigns with him and designed a few drops on the PGA way that is really, you know, had a great, had a great result. And after he was like, how do I create a really awesome NFT? And so coming from a gaming, gaming and blockchain background, we created it and it's called Replicator. And the replicator is really interesting because this is a conceptual art piece that can only exist as an NFT, like the medium that can only exist, you know, because it is a piece of artwork that is linked to the smart contract itself. So the smart contract runs the artwork experience. The idea is that it's a photocopier, and then every single month it would reprint itself or replicate itself based on a deterministic model that was dictated by the smart contract. And so previously, a lot of NFTs were just pretty much taking an image or video and put it in the blockchain. So now you had this piece of artwork that you know, was very unique and very, I would say, crypto native in that sense. And this piece sold that Phillips for $4.2 million. And it was, this was significant because it was the first time a major artwork had sold on a telephone contract. You know, previously you had the Beeple piece that sold on the Makerspace contract. But after that, people started really looking at, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean to have my Westmark contract? And as we started talking to artists, we realized that there was a big kind of knowledge gap between the idea of trying to share a contract and having your own contract. And to us, the, the benefits were just greatly immense. The reason why you want your own contract is one, you didn't have to be beholden to any platform. So in a lot of cases, if you didn't own your smart contract, you'd be, it'd be up to the platform to be the ones who, you know, I guess maintain the annoying infrastructure for your work. And so if the platform goes down or, you know, it's not coded right, then you could be either deplatformed or or not be able to do what you want, not be able to do what you want to do. So the second thing too is capabilities. 
a lot of these contracts out there are just literally just minting uh, images or video, right? So just a straight up JPEG. But what you can do if you have a much more contract is you can actually do a lot of programmatic things and create really interesting experiences. If you like on-chain things, you could have artworks be linked to other things, NFTs, you know, being able to influence other NFTs and so forth. And these are some, like some of the capabilities that we built to our smart contracts. The other thing to do is royalties. So, you know, we were very pro-royalty from the very start. We built it into smart contracts. And really what this did, it allowed artists to really create, really take control over their artwork and their creativity. And the thing is that the way we designed everything was that we designed for the long term so that, you know, what I say and I always have is that if Manifold or myself as individuals and company ever disappear, all the work that we have and all the work that the creators have deployed or, you know, like created using our technology will be able to live on. And so, you know, you can't really say that for every other platform out there. You know, but you know, that's one thing that we've really taken to heart as you know, when we were building Manifold. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, from there, the creation of Manifold was like, we started off with an open source contract called the Manifold Creator Contract. We started deploying these things. And all of a sudden, everyone was like, oh, yeah, it's really, you know, it's actually really important to have an open contract. And that's how we started, you know, like getting a footprint in the ecosystem. And I would say that we were already responsible for a shift from Shift from you know making on share contracts to almost every artist now having their own own sovereign smart contract. Yeah, amazing. Lots of really good stuff to dig in there. One of the three lines that I keep hearing here with talking with NFT creators is this concept of sovereignty, Richard, which you touched on. So if I'm hearing correctly, what you're saying is, yeah, as if I'm a creator, I own this smart contract. And that means that I can port that over to whichever platform I choose, right? I'm not really at the at the whims or mercy of these centralized web two platforms, as it were, where a lot of times people spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into maybe building an audience somewhere. And then for whatever reason, maybe they get removed. And so all that effort has gone to waste. Whereas with NFTs as a creator, you have a closer relationship with your fans or your collectors, and you can basically take them with you wherever you go. Yeah, so that's the idea. So that's the idea of like portability of all your content. And so, you know, well, the way we like to think about it is we have a saying that the creator is the platform. And so what NFTs represent to us from that aspect is before you had all these platforms and creators would willingly give their content over to the platforms. And so let's just take like Instagram, for example. When you publish something on Instagram, you're pretty much giving Instagram the rights to display and use that content within their application. And you know, they have copies of it. They can use it for whatever, whatever purposes they want. It can be displayed in you know, next to ads that you may or may not like. And so it's pretty much you are giving that to them, right? Where it's it's the other way. Yeah, right? and you you probably sign you probably give them that right somewhere in that terms of service that no one reads, right? Yeah. Without yeah, that's exactly what that's exactly what happens, right? And so NFTs kind of flips that equation. So it says that hey, I have content, I'm publishing it on myself, then you as a platform now have to ingest my content and I have control over that content. And so you know, that's why we think it's really important, the idea of sovereignty, is because at the end of the day, these platforms are really, you know, I, I, a very common thing that I've heard from creators was that, well, they were building audiences on a platform and also the platform will change their, their, their algorithm. And, you know, and on these platforms, it's the platform who owns the audience. So the creators are bringing the content, they're attracting the audience, and then at the end of the day, it's the platform who owns the audience. And so what NFTs allow it allows for creators to build their own audience on their own platform and they can port that audience to whatever you know partners they want at the end of the day. Yeah, and that segues nicely into another point you made, which I, I just wanted to circle back on. It's this idea that the technology shapes the culture and vice versa. I think, you know, eventually, <clears throat> you know, like we're we're talking about infrastructure at the end of the day. But I don't think people realize how how important infrastructure is and how you can be constrained, let's say, as a creator or an artist based on the platform or, or the infrastructure that you're using. And so I think it's important to sort of be aware of that. And there's an interesting interplay where I think that the technology, as I said, the technology shapes the culture, but the culture also has an opportunity to shape the technology. And it's certainly an optimism. We're very intentional about that. We're thinking about that. We're trying to make things that are built by humans and for humans, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I think that technology culture go hand in hand. You know, you can't just build something and expect people to use it. It has to be sort of a movement behind it. 
And, you know, over the last few years, we have seen this movement of people coming on chain and really just understanding, like, you know, there's a new paradigm for how we interact, you know, on the web. I think that's like really exciting. I do too. I think it's a, it's a very exciting proposition for any creative and really just for any user of the internet. So I'd like to transition now, Richard, to uh, originally you launched Manifold, which is a, a Web3 creative platform. You launched it on L1 Ethereum and you recently made the move to OP Mainnet. So I'd like to just briefly touch on, on that decision, what the thinking was behind it. Can you, can you elaborate a little on the, on the move to OP Mainnet? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing lately is that a lot of the, the cost of entities have come down quite dramatically. And so I like to think of it as last year, there was, a whole, there was this whole idea behind NFTs were mainly up for investments, right? So people are buying these NFTs for, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And really that drove a lot of motivation for why people were purchasing NFTs. There was the art market on the side. Art had a very different tack because when people are buying art, it's kind of for artists because they like things or, you know, to, to collect, them, collect them. And so... You know, there was this whole idea that, you know, people were collecting art or people were speculating on NFTs. But we're now seeing a shift where NFTs are now going towards more consumption and engagement and consumables. And so with that, the prices of NFTs are going, are going down quite dramatically. And so if you look at Manifold in particular, the average price of Manifold NFT is around, I think, like five to ten dollars. Right? And these are the majority of them. And so the the next kind of you know thing to think about too is on the, from an underlying infrastructure te- technology perspective is the gas fees. And so when an NFT costs, you know, we'll say $100, people will be like, wait, I'll pay $5 in gas to get this NFT. And, but when an NFT is a dollar, it doesn't make sense to pay, you know, $5 in gas for a dollar or even a free NFT. And that's where a big disconnect comes in. And so even for creators, you know, I think during the, the whole Pepe run, when gas on L1 Ethereum was... I think it was close to hundreds and each price was near like two grand. To make an FT, it, was, it, was, it would cost $20 just for the main transaction fee. And then, you know, so I did, an, did an analysis and re- looked at and the total amount being spent on gas was roughly, you know, way higher than the value of the assets being minted. And so, you know, we saw like this a very big, a pretty deep lull in just creation and collecting in general. <laughs> so, you know, and then after the, the question is, you know, how do you solve the problem? And this is where uh, L2s come, in, come into play. And so what we see happening is because L2s offer pretty much, you know, an order of magnitude cheaper gas fees. So, you know, you, you now mint an empty on Optimism using Manifold for, you know, like, like five to 10 cents. And so what we can't, what we predict will happen is that we're going to see more creation activities and more collecting activities around, you know, lower price point entities. And what this does, it enables more types of entities to be created. It creates different layers for entities, and it also allows it to create new mechanics that just weren't possible on L1 just because of cost. You know, like, for example, that we had a, you know, we did the Alpha Centauri Kids piano auction, and those were like, there was like 50 NFTs that were all up for auction, but the net gas cost spent on bidding for those NFTs ended up being around $30,000. And these, these were just for bids. This wasn't even delivery, just, just, just straight up bidding. And so, you know, a world that we see is that imagine all the bids were on an LCU, right? Pretty much no cost for bidding, but then you can actually deliver the NFT to sell one where people expect the value to be. And so those are some of the things that we're thinking about uh, creating that would not be possible just because you know, the economics of doing some mechanics in L1 are just infeasible. Yeah, just to bring this full circle now, back to this concept of, of, of artists and creators and people being constrained by the medium or the platform. Um, with these, with this radical reduction in costs, yeah, I think we're in uncharted territory here, and we're going to st- start to see some new and innovative use cases for NFTs. And so it's, it's exciting times. And yeah, it just makes sense, right? Like if all you have access to is like a piece of paper and some pencils, you're probably going to make a drawing with those things. And because of this reduction in costs in afforded by L2s, I think there's going, we're going to start to see some some new stuff and some new use cases for NFTs. So. Very exciting. So speaking of which, Richard, with the with the move of Manifold to OP Mainnet, I think there's been some work done to to try and help facilitate that transition for creators. Do you want to talk about this incentive rebate that 
that you've done in partnership with Optimism for creators? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we always believed in is that we are actually trying to make accessibility one of the forefronts uh, for creators. And so, you know, as when we launched the Optimism campaign, we were like, one of the big problems was how do creators get Optim- Optimism E to deploy the contracts? So, you know, you can bridge your ease, but what we did was that we said for any manifold creator who had deployed a contract previously, you could go, you could go collect this NFT and what you'll get is pretty much a, you get a, a rebate pretty much to deploy a contract. And so it's really interesting. It's really unique how we did it. So what it is, it's a claim page He's built on top of manifold, but you can, if you collect the NFT along with the delivery of the fee, you will get 690 and OPE, which is more than enough to deploy a contract, mint a dozen NFTs, also deploy a dozen claim pages and really just get started on with on creating an OP. One of the very interesting one of the interesting things about this campaign is that you you can purchase it using credit card and it costs a dollar. And so pretty much pretty much we're giving away free OP to get started on with creation of, on optimism. And you don't have to like go through bridging, you just go in there, enter your credit card, hit a button, and then you'll be all set to go. And so you know, we've seen really good uptake on this campaign. We created a really cool NFT. It's also the first manifold NFT that we ever launched publicly. And we have some really cool things that we want to do with this NFT in the future, which is, you know, for example, giving out or not enabling kind of exclusive features on on manifold for all OP creators. Yeah. So this is for creators who deployed a contract via manifold on layer one Ethereum, right? They're the ones who are eligible for this rebate on OP mainnet. And it's a testament to just how cheap OP Mainnet is that with $6 in Optimism ETH, you can do pretty much anything you, you could desire to do on Manifold. Yeah, that is correct. So yeah, we did analysis and it's more than enough to play multiple contracts and multiple claim pages to really get started. You know, one of our theses is, is that creators who go and get started in OP or on Optimism will be productive in Optimism and start earning, you know, ETH on Optimism and they'll kind of stay in that network network. Fantastic. And Richard, you mentioned that there's been some feedback from some of the creators. I think you're planning on maybe iterating on this incentive, maybe making it a little bit more. I don't know. There's There's been some feedback and, and maybe ways that it can be improved. Do you want to speak a little to that? Yeah. So, you know, that's the things we have planned for this is that like right now it's available for any or any creators who's previous deployed contract. We're going to expand it a bit more so that even if you haven't deployed a contract, if you deploy, if you just deploy a, a contract on mainnet L1, you'll also be eligible for, you know, getting OPE to deploy a, a, a similar contract on on Optimism itself. We're also looking at different creators who are interested, and you know, really our goal is to get as many contracts. Our goal is to make it so that if anybody wants to deploy a contract on o, on OP, they should be uh, they should be able to do, to get started with creation. So we're really trying to create these programs so that. Getting your first OPE is not the very to you to creation on Optimism. Yeah, and I can speak firsthand to how easy it is to get started on Manifold. I'd encourage everybody, I've said this before, I'll say it again, like the best way to learn something is just to try it out and experiment. So if you go to manifold.xyz, it's very straightforward to deploy your own smart contract and create your own NFT, which is a, a very fun and cool experience. Besides kind of tweaking that incentive platform, Richard, I wonder if you want to discuss anything else that Manifold has planned in, in, in terms of the, the near, medium, long-term roadmap. Yeah. So, you know, I think one thing we're rolling out to is discovery of NFTs. So we're building out a, a trending OP or trending on optimism page that will showcase different indicators who have deployed, uh, who have launched claim pages. And we really think that's will help with sort of showing the engagement of the network itself. A lot of creators have asked, you know, are there collectors on, on Optimism? And yes, the resounding answer, answer to that is yes, because, you know, as you know, Optimism, you deployed your Bedrock NFT and there's over, I think, like 70,000 collectors of that NFT itself. We also have a Coinbase Quest campaign going on right now. It has been quite successful. So we have a few creators who have, you know, over I think like five or 10,000 collectors at this point. And so, you know, really just want to show that there is a vibrant ecosystem on Optimism. And that creation is viable and we really just want to make it easy for creators to get started offering NFTs on Optimism to their to various collectors. Absolutely. Yeah. And now that all these all these platforms are moving to Optimism, yourself included, I think we're we're really going to start to see this creativity flourish. I can't wait to see what results. I think we're close to winding down here, Richard. Is there anything else you wanted to add today before we close this out? 
no, you're not. I think I'm just like really excited for the future. I think L2 is well sure in, you know, a brand new era of creation. You know, I think that, you know, it's more about just getting the word out there and kind of helping creators understand that, you know, it is L2s are sort of the next generation of creation on, on chain. And really, we're just going to keep building tools to facilitate and foster that. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us on OP Radio, Richard. Also cannot wait to see what the future holds. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll catch you for the next one. Have a great rest of your day, and stay optimistic, y'all. All right. Thanks for having me.